Hey, John. Um, my training and um, research work is funded by a fellowship grant through the Morris Animal Foundation. Please um, hold the microphone off your mouth. Yep, sorry about that. So my training uh, is funded in part by Morris Animal Foundation, um, and part of that is actually funded by the Newfoundland Club of America Charitable Trust. So um, thank you for that. It's really nice to be here, uh, sponsored by both of those organizations. The three universities that are listed there are all collaborating universities that have contributed to this research, um, some of which I've been at um, and uh, done the work there, as well as uh, the doctors that have come before me, um, looking at SAS in this breed. Dr. Mears, Dr. Lemkuel, Dr. Reyna, and Lucene um, are all part of the project team that's been working on this. So as an outline for today's talk, um, first, we'll go through the background of SAS as a disease, and then we'll talk specifically about the timeline of research in SAS within the Newfoundland breed. Um, <clears throat> we'll go through the genetic studies that we've done at the university so far, and then we're gonna talk about something that we think is pretty exciting, which is an identification of a mutation that's associated with this disease in Newfoundlands. And we'll have lots of time for questions and kind of a wrap up of our findings. So as a general background, SAS is about the second most common congenital heart disease in dogs. Um, it's characterized by this ridge of tissue just below the level of the aorta. And that ridge of tissue is what allows um, the generation of a heart murmur and what we identify in your dogs in the clinic if they're SAS affected. Um, it's pretty common in large breed dogs. Sporting breed and working breed dogs often get SAS as their congenital heart disease. But the clinical signs of this disease vary pretty widely. We know that severely affected dogs can have as short of a lifespan as about 19 months, while mildly affected dogs may really have no outward clinical signs of having disease at all. The disease characteristics themselves really look a lot like um, this picture. So what, what I'll show you is what we're identifying when we do echocardiograms or ultrasounds of the heart. And so this is a view of um, a Newfoundland heart here on the right of the screen. What I'm pointing at here is the left ventricle, and it's the left ventricular muscle of this dog. This black cavity is where the blood is held, and this is the aorta leaving the heart itself with the aortic valve right here. And this ridge of tissue that you see, this little white um, ridge right here, is actually the agent that we see with subvalvular aortic stenosis. And so that lesion is the offending cause that then leads the heart muscle to get thick, causes the generation of the heart murmur, the aorta itself can dilate, and that valve can leak. 
from a diagnosis standpoint, um, the gold standard has always been, unfortunately, finding this lesion in dogs at time of autopsy. And so to do a better job at identifying SAS than that, we've relied on um, techniques previously of angiography, looking at um, the presence of that ridge or ring of tissue below the aorta based on a dye injection, or echocardiogram or ultrasound of the heart is what we use today, looking at images like we just saw. And then we also measure the aortic outflow tract velocity. So if you've had dogs to an echo clinic before to have them screened for SAS, we measure their aortic outflow tract velocity and use that as an indication of SAS. So normal dogs have a certain level, while affected dogs have an elevated aortic outflow tract. So this is the part that you've probably all seen on your OFA forms, um, where we check off whether they have a murmur or no murmur. And if they have a heart murmur, we might recommend an echo. On the echo, uh, we classify them in one of three groups, either affected, normal, or equivocal. And those are ranges of disease categories that have been set up by the kind of governing body that certifies veterinary cardiologists in this group called ARCH. So what you'll see cardiologists use most of the time is a aortic velocity of greater than 2.4 meters per second as affected. If they're normal, they're less than 1.8. And if they're in the middle, we call them equivocal. So those are dogs that we don't really know uh, whether they have a mild form of the disease or if they just have some other reason for their aortic outflow tract velocity to be a little elevated. From a treatment standpoint, there's really no demonstrated good interventional technique to relieve aortic stenosis in dogs. Um, nothing that we can do really changes their clinical outcome beyond that of medical management at this time. There's a lot of research into this area, and um, earlier today I heard a good result from one of the new techniques, but unfortunately it hasn't been done in enough dogs to really know if that's gonna come out as, as the real result time and time again. <coughs> With medical management, these dogs that are severe um, can have a delayed onset of disease for four to five years, um, but ultimately may develop syncope or fainting from their heart disease, congestive heart failure, or sudden death. So this is a timeline of the 37 years that you guys have been supporting SAS research in Newfoundlands. All the way back in 1976, Dr. Patterson and his colleagues looked at inherited heart disease in Newfoundland dogs, described it as discrete subaortic stenosis, and said that it was definitely a heritable condition. Then in 1998, Dr. Lemkuhl and Dr. Mears at Ohio State started collecting samples for genetic studies and kind of better describing the phenotype of this disease. In 2005, um, Dr. Mears, Len Kuhl, and Montegura looked at the therapy of this disease to see if they could use a balloon treatment to um, palliate the symptoms of SAS. In 2012, Dr. Strada's group described a new technique for ballooning dogs with severe SAS to hopefully prolong their survival time. In 2012, um, you guys actually funded a, a genome-wide study of Newfoundland dogs with subaortic stenosis um, in order to see if we could identify a genetic cause of SAS. And that brings us to today, 2013, where we've actually identified a mutation in Newfoundland dogs that have SAS. So 37 years from start to the time that we actually have a genetic mutation identified to start working with. <coughs> So this is more of the genetic background of the disease. I mentioned in 1976, Dr. Patterson started looking at this disease in Newfoundlands. And back then he determined that it was likely an autosomal dominant condition with incomplete penetrance. So he said that he thought that this disease was inherited in every generation, um, but it was possible that some dogs with the mutation may not show signs of the disease. We also started looking at SAS in families of children. Uh, this was kind of a sporadic or rare disease in human beings that does exist, although no mutation in, in human beings has been reported. 
from the early genetic studies in 1998, uh, Dr. Lindfield and Muirs looked at SAS and its family history and saved genetic samples on dogs to do a family-based study of the genetics of this disease. So that was called linkage at the time. Unfortunately, linkage-based studies were unsuccessful at finding a mutation in the Newfoundland. So that brought us to kind of my involvement with the study, which is this SNP array and genome-wide association technique. So this is the kind of newer technique that's being used in studying a lot of different diseases. I'll explain what each of those things mean and show you a couple pictures um, of, of what they look like. But first, we kind of have to define it a little bit. Um, the first part is, what is a SNP, or what do I mean when I say SNP array? And a SNP is really just a single change in the DNA of an individual. That change may not mean anything as it relates to disease, but we can take advantage of looking at those individual DNA changes in both affected or diseased individuals versus normal individuals. And so that's what a genome-wide association study is. This picture is big and has a lot of stuff on it that looks a little confusing, but the gist of it is that we really take the DNA samples of a large population of diseased dogs and normal dogs, and we put them on this amazing chip technology that looks at over 170,000 individual DNA changes all at once. And then it's kind of a massive exercise in comparing those results. And so what happens is they say, are any of these individual DNA changes more likely to happen in one group or another group? And so we will then plot the kind of most interesting changes in the disease group on this really fancy diagram at the bottom where each color represents a different chromosome. And so dogs have 38 chromosomes. And the higher the peak, the more interesting the chromosome to contain a potential genetic mutation that causes the disease. So in this example, you can see these dots up here are almost off the scale, making this chromosome, chromosome 8, the most interesting. And so we did this technique in Newfoundland. So we took 24 normal, non-related Newfoundland dogs that we had evaluated by echocardiogram and by auscultation. We collected their blood sample and harvested DNA. Some of these dogs were collected way back in 1997 or 98 at Ohio State. Many of them have long since passed away. But we needed to use 24 dogs that were essentially unrelated because we don't wanna just identify a mutation that's in one single family of Newfoundlands. We're really looking for a, for a broad category of diseased dogs to study so that our mutation will hopefully be in the entire Newfoundland population. And so we looked at those 24 affected and 24 normal Newfoundlands. You can see that the normal dogs had a nice normal aortic velocity. Remember, less than 1.8 was important. And the affected dogs had clearly high aortic velocities, being greater than 2.4. They were pretty even mixes of males and females. And the affected dogs were all the way down to 14 weeks of age when we found them. So this is the actual Newfoundland data. So it's a lot of information on a single slide, but the interesting thing is this line, this red line, is the cutoff point for when you should start being interested in the changes. And so what you can see is that Newfoundlands really had a lot of regions of interest on their genome-wide association study. So this is the work that the Charitable Trust funded, and we found many chromosomes that potentially contain the mutation of interest. So it was good, but it wasn't good enough for us to say we need to look specifically on one or another. But we knew when we're looking, we should keep chromosome 3, 10, 20, 21, and maybe 30 on our list of interest. So what do you do when <clears throat> there's really no previously described mutation in people to start with? And your genome-wide association study, that massive study that we just completed, says that it could be on one of maybe 10 chromosomes. But we decided to take a new approach. Um, this time, it, we would look at the entire dog genome of affected Newfoundlands by a new technique called RNA sequencing. 
And so again, this allowed us to use a lot of um, the information and samples that were collected way back in 1997. Um, we actually used two SAS affected Newfoundlands, um, both of which had heart tissue donated after they passed away to our laboratory. And we did massive comparison of, of their entire genome um, <coughs> from RNA, uh, from their heart tissue itself. And so what we compared were those two affected Newfoundlands to some other dogs of different breeds that did not have SAS and what we know about the normal dog genome or the normal sequences. Of that comparison, we found millions of genetic changes in all of those samples, about 20,000 of which were in Newfoundlands. But then you start kind of whittling away at the information to find the most interesting changes. What you can see is that only a few thousand were in both of the affected Newfoundland samples. Then there were really only 20 genes that came to the top of the list if we kind of screened by those chromosomes of interest from the genome-wide association study. And then when you start looking at additional dogs that had SAS, only one gene came to the top of the list as interesting to keep looking at. And that was the one that we found uh, the mutation in. So we found an insertion mutation so what that means is that the normal genetic code is present in all dogs. This is an example of that area in normal dogs. So this is the normal dog genetic code. And then what you see when you come down to an affected Newfoundland dog is that they have an extra three pieces of genetic information right here. And so we found this was a consistent change in Newfoundlands that had SAS. Um, it added a kind of part of the protein structure, it added a whole amino acid to the sequence, and it was inherited either in a homozygous fashion, so you could have two copies of this gene inheriting one from each of your parents, or you could have a single copy, and if you have a single copy, you look like these guys down here. So just by doing direct sequencing now, which is a kind of quick and easy technique, we can see what a normal dog looks like compared to a homozygous affected dog compared to a heterozygous affected dog. So this becomes a really clever screening technique for identifying the presence of this mutation. And it was inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern with incomplete penetrance, just like Dr. Patterson said in 1976. So that was pretty interesting. Um, affected dogs, like I said, can have one or two copies of the gene, uh, which means really any affected dog can then go on to produce affected puppies. But if you're affected homozygous, meaning you have two copies of the mutation, you're certainly going to pass on that mutation to all of your offspring. The incomplete penetrance part is an important point to, uh, to highlight. Uh, Dr. Patterson noted it back in 1976, and we still see that today. So not all Newfoundland dogs that have this mutation will develop disease. So, Right now, with the samples that we've run, which are quite a few, um, we see about an 80% penetrance, okay? And then there's also difference in disease severity. We all know that. You guys have all seen dogs that have really severe disease, and their litter mate also has SAS, but has really mild disease. Um, we have not found out why that is yet, but we know that that's true. And so I think it's important to remember that not all dogs with the mutation will show disease. And when they show disease, it's not always going to look the same. So this is a kind of graphical representation of what it looks like when you look at affected and normal Newfoundland dogs. So the shaded or blackened areas are all affected dogs. The checkered areas are all confirmed normal dogs. These are all unrelated Newfoundland dogs. And so what you can see, if you look along the bottom, for a genotype class, the homozygous dogs are almost all affected, except for one. The heterozygous dogs, about 80% of them are affected. And of the reference sequence dogs, the so dogs that are normal genetically, only one of those dogs was reported to have SAS. So what does this mutation do? This, this slide's a little daunting, but it's kind of interesting. So this is the protein that the gene uh, that this mutation is within actually produces. And so we can use 
programs, computer programs, to model what that protein looks like in the body. And that protein is involved in kind of the development of the heart itself. So if you look at this protein, the normal protein is nice and clustered, compact, and the SAS affected dog protein is pretty unfolded at the end. So you can imagine if this is really important in heart development and the way that the aorta and the outflow tract forms, having a protein that's no longer put together the way it's supposed to be would be a bad thing. So we're now to the point with the mutation that we can actually go ahead and test for it. So we'll be here for the next few days doing the heart clinics. Um, and we have buccal swabs, so you can do it with a cheek swab or with a blood sample. Um, we can do semen or tissue samples, so if you have dogs that you no longer have and you're curious about what their mutation status is, we can test on those types of tissues as well. And similar to other genetic tests, we'll report them out as either negative, heterozygous, or homozygous positive. This is actually a picture, interestingly enough, I work in a building just behind a giant statue of a Newfoundland um, that's Hannah Ward. So what does that mean for you guys? Now that we know that we have a mutation that's associated with SAS, and we're doing the kind of legwork to prove that that's what causes SAS in this breed, what should we think about going forward knowing that there's a test for this now? And so I think it's important that we highlight that Newfoundland dogs are a pretty small gene pool. So this is even smaller than many of the breeds that we work with on a daily basis. The Newfoundland dogs themselves are a really small gene pool. In fact, when we tried to get 24 unrelated dogs, that was really tough. <laughs> it took us, I think, 17 years, to be quite honest. So I think it's important to get to the point that it's almost impossible to think that making changes to your breed isn't going um, to be problematic if we're not really careful. Okay, so. Removal of all affected animals is probably not only impossible, but could really significantly impact the breed in a negative way. So we want to be really careful about that. There are lots of examples in history of breeds that have tried to do that and it's gone the wrong way. Um, so we don't want to suggest that you guys take this mutation information and uh, stop breeding those dogs altogether. But what we would like to do is make it part of kind of a testing guideline for how we might choose what dogs to breed um, at what times to, to other dogs. So <clears throat> there are really tools that we use for making the most responsible breeding decisions when it comes to SAS. And so here are some guidelines that we put together for other autosomal dominant diseases that are incompletely penetrant. And we think that um, this is probably a good starting place for you guys. Um, and obviously there will be exceptions to each of these rules. And that's why we're here and, and we'll be running the lab to talk with folks about what the best choices might be. Obviously, negative dogs don't possess the mutation and won't pass it on. So um, I think if you have a dog to breed and it's a negative dog, then you don't need to worry about our information here. Positive homozygous dogs, at this time, uh, we're going to be cautious about saying this for Newfoundlands, but in general, they wouldn't be recommended to be bred because they are going to pass on the mutation. Okay, I think that um, we say that with a little bit of a grain of salt right now because we're still screening lots and lots of dogs. Positive heterozygous dogs, we would like to say should only be bred to negative dogs because the end goal here would be to slowly kind of keep the genetic uh, diversity the same but get down to a population of mostly negative dogs to choose from. So this is kind of what that looks like. So this would be a good breeding strategy to use if you have a heterozygous individual and a negative or normal individual, you could breed them. Heterozygous is the big G, little g, unaffected is the little g, little g. And so when you breed them, you'll see that you will get two out of four on average, or 50%, that are negative for this mutation. So you could breed these dogs, preserve this dog's lineage and the diversity of the breed overall, and then select these dogs to move forward with, okay? I know it's not a perfect system, right? Because we don't know, maybe these dogs are really not good uh, conformationally or some other reason that would make them bad breeding animals to begin with. But overall, if we follow this pattern, we can get to a point where we might be able to select 
mostly negative dogs. And what are we doing with this information in the future? So how does it cause SAS? That's what we want to know. So our lab is kind of working around the clock right now, looking at this mutation, what it does in the body, where we can find this protein in the body. Just before I left, I was looking at slides of a Newfoundland dog that died in 1998. Um, we have his tissue, and we stained it for this protein the, where the mutation resides. We could see as I was getting ready to leave that this gene and the protein itself is present within the ridge. So just below the aorta, this area kind of lights up with this gene. So that was really exciting for us because the change that we're finding is actually in the tissue that we're interested in. So we're going to work on proving um, a good reason for why this mutation would actually result in SAS. We're also going to try and see if this mutation can describe SAS in other breeds. Um, so lots of other dogs we mentioned get SAS, and we've thus far identified a few other dogs with SAS that have this mutation. Now we've looked at almost 200 dogs of 30 different breeds that do not have SAS, and none of them have this mutation. So um, I think that's good news that this is probably <coughs> strongly, strongly related to SAS. Um, but we want to know if this mutation describes SAS better in other breeds as well. We're also going to decide if SAS equivocal dogs, so those dogs that you go through your cardiac clearance and the cardiologist says, I don't know, maybe you could breed them, maybe you shouldn't breed them. That's up to you. Is he an exceptional breeding specimen? Well, maybe this test um, could be helpful in those dogs. Maybe knowing that this dog that's equivocal is negative would um, make you more likely to breed it, and if it were positive, less likely to breed it. And then lastly, could this help direct treatment options? So um, we know a lot about what different genes do in the body, and we know that SAS is something that you're born with, but that it gets worse as you kind of grow up and grow older. And so if this protein has um, a target that we could maybe medically manipulate a little bit um, with some easy treatment option to slow down the progression of disease, that would be ideal for us. So we're looking into those kind of options as well. So tomorrow we'll be uh, around in the clinic over in the current building. Um, they're all day to answer questions. Certainly I know um, this is new information, so there'll be lots of questions that come up and we're happy to talk with you about that. We'll have mutation test kits so we can send you a buccal swabs if you're interested. You can mail them into the lab and we can tell you what they are, what the results are. And then we'll be doing cardiac clearances all day with auscultation or auscultation and echo. So please stop by if you want to chat. I have plenty of time, I think, for questions if anybody has any. Yeah? Um, do you know, I was going to say, are you sure it's a protein? But obviously it is. What, what kind of protein? Yeah, um, so it is a protein that's involved in kind of morphogenesis of the heart. So is it an enzyme, or is it just a structural protein? Um, it is, it is, uh, it is, sorry, I'm limited on what I'm allowed to say while we're trying to get uh, published. Yeah. published yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so it is, a, it is a protein that is involved in kind of the, it is not an enzyme. I was really surprised that it was an actual protein-coded gene and not a switch, so that makes it a lot easier. Now, and we can get the kits from you and, and mail them to you. Yeah, absolutely. And for free, you know, So we will offer the mutation testing itself. We've done a lot of dogs in the process of describing the mutation, um, that some of which we will have results for if you submitted samples to us, and you can talk with me directly about that. But going forward, the mutation will be at the same kind of mutation testing rate as all of the other tests in our lab, which is $51. Um, and that those mutation tests, what comes back to our lab out of that money that isn't covered in uh, kind of the cost of the test itself, go back into genetic research for your breed and other breeds. Yes? Do you have access to our blood and the chick DNA database? For example, I have dogs in there who may if you if you would like to have your samples from chick 
send to us. They do have DNA that they um, sometimes send for other tests, and you can call and request that, as far as I know. Yes? You said SAS was the second most um, prevalent heart mm -hmm. disease. What is the first? Well, some people say PDA. So actually, if you read the literature, it goes back and forth whether subaortic stenosis or patent ductus is really the most common. Personally, I think SAS is the most common um, because it's a lot harder to diagnose. So there are probably tons and tons of dogs with SAS out there that just aren't seen. Yeah. The study through uh, more uh, through uh, Canaan Health Foundation with Rotties and mm -hmm. Newfoundlands. Did you find do you have a similar test for the Rotties as well as the Newfoundlands? So we do not yet have a test for Rottweilers or Golden Retrievers with this disease, but that's one of the things that we're working on really hard in the lab, looking at the rest of um, this gene itself and genes in the neighborhood um, to see if we can identify mutation in those breeds as well. Yes? I'm faking money here. Okay. It's could you just do the buccal swab and skip the echo or the auscultation, or do you really believe they all need to be done? Well, I think that's a really good question. I don't think that um, in kind of the history of cardiac genetics and genetic tests that we've ever found a test that describes all individuals in the population with the disease. So I'm not comfortable saying that a mutation test is ever really going to replace the veterinarian themselves, listening to your dogs and looking at your dogs. Um, I do think if you have a dog that tests mutation homozygous and has a murmur, that it's probably not a good breeding candidate. And if you're going to save, uh, if you want to save the money on the echo, uh, maybe that's an okay strategy if you're you know, trying to prioritize. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There are lots of other diseases to consider and things to worry about, but um, I think from a prioritizing scheme, I don't think this is going to replace hospital teacher. Yeah. Um, you know when and where you're going to publish? I do not know. I do not know the answer to either of those questions, but we will certainly let you know. <laughs> do you prefer blood over over Google swabs just because of volume? I think in the beginning phases when we're researching the disease blood is great um, from a standpoint of we end up with extra DNA that we can use in additional studies. But um, going forward from a testing standpoint, really both work about the same. Yeah. Can I ask you to go back to the slide where you showed the, the insertion? Sure. Because it seems like you have both an insertion and then uh, a, oh, yeah. a non- <laughs> Sure. It is a really, it is a really confusing way to look at it. Um, it's hard to explain it for me without drawing on a napkin or something, but I'll do my best. So, um, I, 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 we'll see if, if it doesn't work. I'll come over and okay. let me know. Um, so this this guy here is the the double homozygous dog with an insertion, and he has a clear insertion. Um, these three individuals, these three individuals are heterozygous, and although it looks like they just have a change here. What's really happened is one strand of their DNA has the insertion, the other one does not. And when they overlap, the reading gets really messy. And so what would normally be a TGC here has part of this sequence flapped back over it. And so it's just coding incorrectly. When you open up the chromatogram where we actually see the different peaks of the DNA itself, these are really messy looking because one is normal and one is abnormal. And these are beautifully clean, they just have something extra. Yes? I have a question. Um, I, I have a dog who, who was um, uh, echo doctor and diagnosed with um, grade 4 SAS. And um, I, I'm wondering whether um, there's any merit in taking him back to the vet school, you know, every year, every couple of years, and to have it, you know, repeated. Yeah, just in terms of, of you know, management. Yeah. The, the question was in terms of management of dogs with severe SAS and how important it is to go back and get them checked. But personally, I think that getting them re-evaluated every whatever your cardiologist or veterinarian is recommended, 12 to 18 to 24 months, is really helpful because 
I put on one of the slides that um, some dogs are syncopal, so they have bad arrhythmias and they collapse. Some dogs have congestive heart failure, and others just die suddenly. And I think if the goal is to prevent any of those things from happening or, or prolong life as long as possible, those reevaluation exams are going to be the best way to identify that early enough to do something about it. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Yes. On the tails of Marlis's question, um, with the dogs, I mean, relatively in the range of mammalian lives, fairly brief. Um, do we worry about sclerotic changes exacerbating, let's say, in this case, is a uh, grade four? Uh, is there any contribution to the potentiation, if you will, of that that would make that a valuable examination too? So sclerosing around it as well as the stenosis. Yeah, I mean, I think we see changing in the aortic outflow track of these dogs that have severe SAS, and I think the the magnitude of change is a big reason that we have them reevaluated. So, sure. Anybody else? <laughs> oh, yes. Slides past that, where the bar graphs, thank you. Yes. Why, why did the one have one? Another one in the reference. One in the reference sequence. So and that's a really good question. I think that this is a this is the way that we see most cardiac genetic tests go, which is that not all members of a population with a disease are going to have the same genetic cause for it. So Maybe that one dog um, that was um, reference sequence that had SAS, is that, this is the one we're talking about right. probably. Right, so right there, two clear dogs yep. made, that, made that dog. No, made a litter. Or had, had a litter, but one out of that litter had SAS. Is, am I reading that right? Um, am I understanding that right? I, so this guy is affected, but does not have the mutation. So what that says to me, yeah. okay. what that says to me is that there might be another cause of SAS in the Newfoundland, and maybe that's a in utero change, the exposure to something, environmental, or another mutation itself. So just because if we do your test, your yes. swab test, and this dog clears, and we find another dog that's clear, and we put yes. them together, their litter should be tested as well to see if they're a carrier. No, I don't think so. I think I think I think you are absolutely correct. If you do it, if you have a negative dog tested through a lab and a negative dog tested through a lab, and you breed them, the chance that they're going to be positive for this test is zero. Uh, the but litter. the litter, the litter correct, litter. correct. Okay. Um, but the chance that they will have SAS is not zero. It's still possible that there's another reason for them to develop SAS. Okay, albeit that that's a very small number of. You know, one, one dog out of that group. So those in that litter, mm -hmm. like if we want to breed them, yes. do they need to be tested? Should they be? Or well, I think, just I think it depends on how good your record keeping is. Um, if you have really good record keeping on what their mutation status is, and the person that you're breeding with trusts that record keeping, then you, you have your answer on what so the possibilities are. So we keep the urea clear through parent parentage, right? Mm -hmm. the clearance for your puppy and the parents are clear. Mm -hmm. Is that how this will work as well in the future? That's a great question. Yeah. That's a question. Yeah. We, I won't actually, we'll, we'll submit an answer to any test that comes through as far as what the genotype status is of that dog. So we'll say whoever whoever submits the sample will report back whether they're negative or positive. Um, but we won't take those results ourselves and then send out certification letters for litters. Um, if that helps. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you happen to know if that one affected was an echo result or an echo? Yeah. So all of our all of our dogs are echo. These dogs are all echo screened. Um, with the exception of a few that we actually have had tissue on and have, have used that way. So I, I did have a bitch that echoed as having SAS and did not have it in their house. Yeah, and just like you say, I think that that happens. I think we know that there's probably multiple causes of many congenital heart diseases, so that's possible. Yes? So 
if I heard you correctly, the, you could have a teratogenic effect, uh, unknown origin, and end up with SAS unrelated to the genetics. Absolutely, yeah. I think that there's lots of um, other reasons for congenital heart defects to show up. Um, obviously, we know, looking at kind of the history of what happens in breeds, if, if you breed two affected dogs, you often get affected puppies, that the large contribution of what causes SAS is genetic. But I don't think we can say that there is not possibly other things that could lead to SAS on more rare occasions. Is it the OFA that has to come to you for the simple if they want to include it in on clearances, or do you go to them? Or do you go to them? So this is something that will be added to the OFA database? Um, this, that's something that's not necessarily true. That's something that you guys would work on with OFA if, if you wish to have this mutation information included in OFA. Um, then you guys could submit that to them. I think you have a really cool job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I agree, absolutely. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, yes, Jenny. Okay, I'm going to open up a, a can of worms. Can you comment on um, relatedness of colonic stenosis and PDA in Newfoundland? Yeah. Um, Favorite stenosis as well? Sure. So Jenny's asking about, um, you may have, heard of or seen or owned a dog that had multiple congenital defects. Specifically, PDA and pulmonic stenosis can sometimes be seen with aortic stenosis. That is the exception of the rule. And so um, I think when we're talking about combined congenital defects, um, I'm not sure that we would lump those in as the same gene effect. Um, so when we were doing our study, I did not include dogs that had, let's say, PDA and SAS. In the, in the genetic samples. We were really working on pure SAS. Um, we will get there where we test dogs that are submitted that probably have multiple defects, but uh, we have not done that yet. It would not be surprising to me if that were a different thing. <coughs> yes? Similar question on valvular defects. Mm -hmm. um, valve valve versus, dysplasia. oh, like mitral valve? Mitral valve dysplasia. Yeah. Dysplasia. We also did not did not um, include mitral valve dysplasia or tricuspid valve dysplasia in the genetic samples. That kind of muddies the waters from a genetic investigation standpoint. Um, I think that those are interesting cases. Sometimes I think the mitral valve itself is what causes the outflow tract obstruction. So um, I would venture a guess that those are different entities. Yes. In cystinuria, our current uh, recommendation is one generation is considered clear by testing, but we test the third generation again for breeding. Uh, because we don't know what causes these genetic mutations. Is that, is that correct? And that could happen again in the future. Sure. So, uh, you know, I think we need to continue to do the testing in future generations, although we could skip one generation and test the third. Is that? Sure. I think that's reasonable. I mean, I think um, spot testing to make sure that everything's going as you expected it to is a really good thing. I mean, we all know if you have 12 Newfoundland dogs in a room and you get buccal swabs on 12 dogs in a row and one of them knocks you over, you no longer know which dog you tested. So I think it's reasonable to recheck your results every now and again, for sure. Okay, thanks very much, guys.